the pieces are all coming together to kind of open up the doors for incredible apps that, you know, we really couldn't think of with existing hardware. What sparked your interest in virtual reality technology originally? Where did you originally get on this train? I mean, I've been uh, really passionate about various advanced technology for a while. When first, you know, Rift went on Kickstarter, I was actually not in computer science at the time, but I was like very, uh, keeping a keen eye on it. And then finally, when the CV1 launched, I, I told myself I had to own one, so I bought one. I had I'd been working on a game at the time um, you know, through a university competition, and that just really got me into developing for VR time uh, as I ported it over. Was that the car combat survival game? That's right. So what did you learn about VR development? when building that? I learned a lot about what not to do, actually. See, that, that was an experience that uh, that was a port from a non-VR game. And so like when you're marketing a game, even non-VR, uh, getting it, getting people to pay attention to it is extremely difficult. You know, there's so many games that come out every day. And at the time, you know, when I started working on it, there was maybe only like 30, 40 games on Steam for VR. There's, there's a chance to have your game seen by people. Well, it took me a bit longer than I would have liked to ship it. And then by the time I had... Uh, then there was like a few hundred games on Steam that, that were VR titles and, and getting it even on the Oculus Store was also extremely challenging with all the performance stuff at the time. And in terms of interaction, like it's funny because I started developing the game using a gamepad as the input method and that really faded out uh, over the time of the development of the game. And so by the time I shipped, you know, a gamepad game was no longer desirable from, especially the Vive, you know, having been out for a while, a lot of people just expected that if you're on Steam to have the motion controls. So. And that's what got me to my first job uh, doing XR development professionally at a company called CAE. Uh, working there, I learned uh, learned a lot about AR development. So I worked primarily with the HoloLens, which had quite limited interaction, actually. It was, it was interesting. So it wasn't until I, we got our hands on the HoloLens 2 that uh, we got to really start playing with hand interaction. The company I worked for was a um, partner for Microsoft, so we got some some early hands-on with that. And I actually went off to Redmond uh, with uh, another person on my team, and we just worked with uh, Microsoft engineers for two full weeks, uh, just trying to do porting and experimentation, and learned a whole lot about uh, you know what the, what their mindset around uh, interaction was. And... So with Microsoft's devices, did you find yeah. that their comprehensive MRTK framework made it a lot easier to develop common interactions? It's funny. Um... You know, MRTK is a, is a really nice tool for a lot of people to just get started. A lot of people that aren't as a code literate, you know, tend to really enjoy it as well because they can just drag some components in and get working. The thing that I find challenging with MRTK is that it's very complex uh, in terms of all the different components that you need to set up because, you know, there's just, there's just so many pieces. Like if you have a button, right? You know, there's layers to it. When you poke it at the top, there's like a plate that you push and then the plate goes through in the different layers. All that setup is a complex game object hierarchy. And then on the top, there's also like all these different router components, all these things that are extremely complicated that even a, an experienced developer might not really understand what the heck is going on there. And I know they're trying to improve the, the complexity of it, but the thing is that MRTK actually like started off as a uh, open source project that got kind of taken over by Microsoft and uh, it wasn't really quite finished in the current form when it was taken over by Microsoft and as they they like took it out into private land uh, inside uh, NDA like restrictions to work on whole lens two interactions. and And when they did that, they kind of grafted hand and interaction onto this existing system. And you can kind of see there's like a lot of like weirdness around like how they had to ship that just kind of arose from that. So in the end, like I, I really like MRTK as like a toolbox to kind of, just work with things. And, and I think as a multi-platform system, it's one of the better ones out there. And, and I really believe in just separating off your multi-platform code from your interaction code so that you can kind of take the, the, the code base that you have for your application and bring it to whatever platform you like, um, which, which is, you know, a bit of a challenge in, in the current VR landscape. You know, OpenXR is hoping to improve some of that, but then you're, you're still building on uh, Unity's XR uh, SDK system, which I, I think is, is getting quite good, but still doesn't support hands. It's kind of, you kind of have no choice but to build your own layer over whatever system there is right now. When do you think the industry is going to get a comprehensive interaction framework or toolkit from one of the major players that is kind of simple, easy to use, and takes off in the same way that web frameworks like React? Uh, a web... You know, you have like a, a 2D canvas and, you know, there's all kinds of tools that you can put together to kind of build and showcase stuff on that 2D canvas. But at the end of the day, like you're running on a browser and the browser is a, is a standard. So it's not like we have a standard for game engines yet. You know, there's like a standard for 
graphics pipelines. There's a, there's there's now a standard for input, but there's not a standard for application development and like there is, you know, for the web. Like there are APIs that will work on any browser, but there aren't APIs that work on any game engine. So I think that having a set of tools that you can just take uh, and that will work, you know, kind of universally. Like I, I think it's 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 a it's a really tough problem because that platform would have to be specific to a specific tool. So it's like okay, we're going to build a framework for Chrome, but not it won't work on Firefox. It's, it's a tough problem for sure. And then in the context of saying like Unity, which is, you know, where I work now, I think, you know, there, there is already an effort like, like internally, we have the, the, the XR interaction toolkit that, that, you know, is good. Um, it's still a little bit basic right now. It still doesn't support hands and it's not as polished as say MRTK is. Uh, it's a little tricky, you know, like, uh, you know, people are trying to do their own thing. Um, you know, there's not that many players that are, that are kind of, you know, working in this space, you know, there's Microsoft and, you know, Unity's doing a little bit. Um, Oculus isn't really doing their own thing. I don't really know what Oculus is doing on that front. They, they have what they call the sample framework in there, but I don't really find it very good. I'm confused by the use of the word framework. It's, it just seems like a collection <laughs> of samples and, and yeah. very many of them don't use any of the modern sort of concepts yeah. of interaction you can't use them with hands you can't use many of them no. even on a quest properly yeah yeah so i'm a little bit frustrated with with uh, facebook's tools honestly uh it, it really feels like they have a few maybe a couple of unity developers that just kind of take care of you know putting the tools out to make sure that they support the new sdk you know i'm, I'm sure there's more to it than that and but a lot of the effort is really on the low level for them and and in terms of interaction i think they do their own stuff internally like i haven't tried horizons personally but I've talked to some people who have, and there's a lot of really advanced interaction tools in there. If you look at how they're also developing React XR, you know, for the the shell and the, and the Oculus Quest, like there is a lot of effort going towards it. I I wish they would share a little bit more publicly. Like if you were at um, Oculus uh, Connect Six, they talked about their hand tools and they showed a lot of samples that that seemed quite advanced, like like pinch knobs and stuff like that that you can make use of for hands. Um, that that just never materialized as public to facing tools, which is really unfortunate. Those samples almost looked like they were the part of some kind of UI framework. They looked like common components. You know, they were. Yeah. The, it didn't look like it was part of any standard application Definitely. and not even released as a sample. So are you surprised that Valve hasn't? Well, Valve is working mostly in source, you know, for their, for their interactions and stuff. And I, I think that I will probably see more about that when source two is like a public facing tool. Um, I don't know much beyond that though. Um, in terms of Unity's tools, like the Valve tools and Unity are a little bit lacking at the, at the moment. Like they're, they're working on getting OpenXR up and running. And, and I think once OpenXR is kind of more mature and like all the players are kind of on board with that, I think that you'll start to see you know, like a lot of the conversations are kind of being had over and over again around just getting your app running in, in Unity or in diff, whatever engine you're working in. And I think once we can finally put that to bed and say that, okay, this is how we build an app. It's using these OpenXR APIs and, and you have like a common set of just like, what is a controller? Um, what, what, where, it, where would you point from if you had a laser beam? Where would you... Um, grab from with a grip and having all these kinds of things defined for different control profiles. I think like when you can kind of abstract that out and and stop redefining it over and over again, interaction tools can start to you know be made. Um, but it, again, it takes it takes effort from people to to kind of get together, agree on what kind of tools they want, how to package this in a clean way for developers. Documentation is a lot of work. You know, I, I don't know if you've looked much at MRTK in terms of like. The, the, the work that goes into just making sure things keep working. Like they have a whole testing framework where if you build a component and you want to commit to this repository, you have to write a test and a real-time test. So like I wrote, um, they have hand menus in MRTK where uh, if you flip your hand up, the menu will pop up. And in the old system, before I came and added this, uh, basically your, your, your menu would just appear, right? And, and it would kind of always face your head. So what I added was a, a thing so that when your thumb is not quite looking at you, it kind of appears below and it swings up like a barn door. And, and then once it reaches a threshold, it kind of stabilizes. So it's a little, a little UX thing and it flips away, it looks nice. Um, but just getting that in, I had to write a test that would basically um, mimic having hands. So you click play and then two hands appear, the gesture that triggers it appears. Um, and then there's checks constantly to say, okay, is it in the right state? What's happening? Is it in the right state over time? And then once it terminates, then the hands disappear. And that runs in all automated testing and, and, you know, that kind of stuff is required. You know, if you're building a collaborative framework, you know, with multiple people to make sure that changes over time don't break the existing functionality. And, you know, I think that's one of the big challenges of getting like, as you're describing, like uh, a web-like framework, like automated testing in real-time graphics is, is really tricky. So you started working on bringing Microsoft's MRTK to Oculus Quest in late December, 
2019, if I'm correct? At my previous job, I had started working on a new project uh, for Oculus Quest, and uh, I had started doing the work of porting something uh, like, cause, so at that job, we didn't actually use MRTK. We had our own existing framework. Um, but that framework was inspired a lot by MRTK. And so from the work of, you know, reading through MRTK's code base to understand how it worked, kind of implement similar features in, in the framework that I was building, I had a pretty good understanding of, you know, the ins and outs of the, of the framework. But of course, that, that framework that I was working, you know, it's, it's a private framework. I couldn't share it much about it. Um, so um, I wanted to, to put something out there. You know, I, I, had, I had the experience of, of bringing kind of like Oculus Quest hands to multi-platform code of working on interactions for hands and stuff. And so I wanted to put something out there that was kind of a test bed that I can, you know, experiment with uh, for Oculus hand tracking. Uh, given that I owned one as well, you know, was, I, I didn't own a HoloLens 2 personally. I, I was able to use one for work. You know, I'm, I'm credited for porting this to, to Quest, though. Um, I, I didn't even do the original work, though. That's the thing that's funny, is that there was uh, someone in Japan, Tarukosu, I might be misspelling his, his username. He's a you know, brilliant developer, works for this uh, this small company in Japan and Tokyo, I believe, called the Hololabs, and they work on uh, mixed reality stuff as well. And uh, he had done some basic work of, you know, getting the code to talk to each other. And so, like, and he did a pretty good job. And and so I, t I, I started from there, gave him some credit on, on my GitHub and, and really tried to polish it up because I thought at the time that, like, his implementation was usable but like had a lot of bugs and tracking and you know they're like the transforms were off and didn't really talk in the right sense and so i used that as a starting point you know cleaned it up and shipped it up and then made a lot of improvements over time since then and uh yeah that's kind of how it got started of what you can talk about and do know that unity is working on in the xr space are you most interested right now what's the most interesting thing unity is working on in this space one of the things right now that we we really uh, recently was the OpenXR, and I, I think OpenXR is very important. OpenXR is that standard where we say this is how an an AR or VR app is built. You know, it's not fully done yet. Uh, it's it's coming um, in a more mature form. You know, as as time goes on. You know, like using it now is a good way to just provide feedback and make sure that you know the things that you would need you know do work. But I I think that's like one of the most important things that we could be doing right now is, you know, making sure that's solid. Unity announced its OpenXR support quite recently. I'm not the one in charge of that, but I, I will say that like, it hasn't been like years that the OpenXR spec is like fully out. Like 2019 is when it kind of like was finalized. And then, you know, you're still waiting on everyone to build their own, you know, run times. There's all this different parts to OpenXR where like, yeah, if you have support for it, but then nothing can run it, then, you know, what are you, what is it for? So it's like a collaboration between a lot of different people and it's quite a bureaucratic process. So I'd say that like, it takes a lot of people talking to each other. And I don't know if you've worked much in, in the enterprise space when you're working between orgs, like everything moves like molasses. So it's very, very slow. A lot of meetings, a lot of people talking to each other, trying to agree on things. And so that's, that's quite slow. And then the other part is really just that, like, you know, the folks at Unity just wanted to to make sure that it, when they had something to say that there was something ready to actually be used, you know, not just make empty promises to say that like, yeah, yeah, we're working on it, but we don't have anything to show you. Like that's kind of, you know, not so useful. So as you say, OpenXR is so vital for the industry. And I hope mm -hmm. in a few years, we are looking back at this kind of era or maybe the era just before now as kind of dark ages, like in the nineties <laughs> yeah. when there were graphics card specific APIs and yeah. things like that. The other thing I'm really excited about with Unity is Mars. Mars is a really cool set of tools that, you know, makes it so much easier to think about building AR experiences in a, in like, cause it, it's a very different thing. AR is a lot more procedural than, than VR is, you know, VR, you can have like your consistent space, you know, like you, you define every part of the space and, and then you build your content around that. Whereas in, in AR, like you're, you're building content that fits to the space that you're in. And so like. Uh, how big everyone's table is is different. How big you know everyone's floors and walls are is all different. And so Mars is like an attempt to really try and um, build tools to simplify. It's uh, it's two parts. First of all, there's there's a simulation part. So the simulation part is really straightforward to think about. It's just you're in the editor, you're in Unity, and um, you want to know what it's like to have your app running. Uh, on device, but you don't want to run it on the device. You want to just, you know, simulate it in the editor. So a lot of people write like tools for their games to simulate what it's like to run through the game. You know, if, if for VR, like you'll use WASD controls or whatnot, but uh, for AR in this case, it's, it's quite nice. You can simulate having a phone in your space um, as you, you can move around the phone and, and watch it like capture data. So you can see it, what it would be like for the phone to start capturing feature points, building planes that like, is just simulated in the editor, which is which is really nice. So that's the first part. 
And the second part is is adding, you know, um, intelligence to the fuzziness of reality. So say that you you take your phone and and you you bring it through a, a floor. Well, you okay, so you detect the floor, the floor is X, Y. So then you can say, uh, uh, as a component, you put like a, a rule that says, um, when a floor that's larger than, you know, five by four meters uh, appears, then I want you to spawn the game space. Uh, so then you can automate that just by like automatically thinking about planes, uh, the little qu quick component you add it, it'll spawn the, the thing. And then you can say, all right, so now that I have a, t a plane, um, say I have a chair and that chair is, you know, to the left of the other chair, but like, Two meters off you know i want a chair that's like a certain distance from the other chair um okay so you detect the chair you detect that chair is that is that far away from the other chair uh you can start spawning content on the chair you can spawn npcs sitting on those chairs and then you can have those npcs look at each other and and you can go even more granular and say fuzziness so like um as the chairs you know grow apart or move closer to each other uh your play space in between them can shrink and expand automatically and there's all this fuzziness that starts to happen which is which is interesting so I, I I don't know if that is you know fully clear, but uh, I think that's like a, a high level understanding of like the big uh, brushstrokes of what Mars is for. And I think that there's applications for Mars beyond even just AR. It's just putting these tools out there and starting to have the conversation around how to think about this procedural stuff is is extremely important. And I think it's just tricky for us to think about right now because AR that in in its most advanced form is currently on phones and phones are very limited in terms of what you can do in terms of input. So I think like it'll take big players kind of putting out consumer level AR headsets or or Oculus kind of bringing pass through and making mixed reality a thing uh, to kind of start to think about Mars in a way that feels more native. If you have like an AR headset that is you know ideally pass through because that's that's I find is the best for games, then then we'll start to really start to see how useful this can really be. Like one of the things they showed really easily is with a quick component, you can add a gaze trigger. So when you look at a building, you can trigger a sequence where like Godzilla will appear from behind the building and and then you'll see him walk over and start doing some destruction. And that kind of thing is like, you know, just kind of paying attention to what the user's looking at, um, fitting in with the world and all this kind of stuff is 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 starting to be possible. And and it's really exciting to see how we're gonna start building content for that. It's it's interesting to see how web development started in the nineties as developing for one single target of a monitor, then moved into responsive web design mm -hmm. for all the different devices. And now it looks like spatial computing is starting to do the same from assuming a two by two yeah. meter space in some rich person's house to now being able to adapt yeah. to every possible living configuration around the world. Yeah, that's right. That's 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 the goal. I think that for for AR apps to really take off, especially in the games or like, you know, at home. Like you really need that kind of responsiveness to, to the space because not everyone's space is the same. And if you just say, I need a five meter square wall to work, um, like some magic leap applications or else it just doesn't work, then you're just out of luck and you can't enjoy the experience, you know, and that's, that's too bad, you know? So like having that ability to adapt to what different people's spaces is like, uh, is, is extremely important. So in October, Microsoft decided to merge your MRTK Quest project into 2.50 of mm -hmm. the MRTK main project. Tell us about that. Yeah, so working on the uh, MRTK Quest uh, project, I've been in like close contact with Microsoft for a while now. And being an MVP, I have some good contacts. And so it's been a, an ongoing communications and collaboration for a, like a little while now. And so, so prior prior to that happening, uh, the Microsoft was you know quite interested because they have a lot of their customers that started using my plugin uh, to bring Quest support to their to their apps, and and uh, so they clearly saw that it was important for their customers to be able to bring their experiences to Quest, and uh, so they started working on it a little bit on their own on the side, and they wanted to do their own thing a little bit because you know my system does require the Oculus SDK uh, because that's what Hands requires um, for the time being, um, and they kind of didn't really want that at first so they started like thinking about it you know how can we bring this in and it seems they they came to the same realization i did is that the only way to really get hand support in is is to use you know the oculus SDK. and so then they started like working more closely with me and it's like okay we're gonna we're gonna bring this in and so i i was talking to one of the developers who was who's working at microsoft you know on this this porting effort and uh, so i just collaborated with him over a few months you know as the as he started like just trying to bring all these changes, you know, refactor some of my changes into their mainline code. Like there's a lot of utility classes I had ended up adding in. You know, some of my favorites are in this class called the hand pose utils. So basically it's what makes my teleport gesture possible. And I think that's the teleport gesture is what really pushed them over the edge to kind of bring this into MRTK. So so it's it's a simple gesture. So you take your hand out, 
and you close your hand and then you have your index finger out and then by closing the index finger you're able to to, to trigger the teleport and i i require that the thumb is outward facing as a kind of you know a fail safe to, to to avoid it and and when you close your hand i actually don't even care about your your pinky and 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 uh, ring finger because those are very poorly tracked on the quest like if you have like a certain angle like kind of do their own thing sometimes so i don't really consider them but to be able to detect that you're closing these fingers it, it's actually not that difficult it's just that the icK doesn't provide it so what you end up doing is just you know uh, having a, a kind of a binary trigger for for when your finger is like closer to your wrist than it isn't is your is your index uh kind of closer to the knuckle or to the closer to the wrist and just by that uh you can do that for kind of any fingers the the thumb is a little different because you use the kind of pinky uh, knuckle but yeah it's able you're able to kind of determine is any of my finger are any of my fingers closed and and just you know having that kind of utility is out there is something Microsoft put in and built around the helper gesture and yeah it's just uh it's an interesting just in conversation bringing things over moving things around and and having them printing it and in the end they gave me a lot of credit for all like my name is written in, on on all the classes that are from MRT Quest on their repo which is quite nice so yeah in the end I I couldn't I couldn't be happier with how it how it played out and it was quite nice on a high level how would you sum up where you think the VR development ecosystem is coming into 2021 and where do you think it kind of will be at the end of this year and maybe three years and maybe five or 10 years? So in the near term, I'm, I'm hoping that by the end of this year, you know, everyone's like, we have full support for OpenXR everywhere. Uh, that's the de facto way to build apps, no matter what platform you're targeting. That's, that's my hope that by the end of this year, that's where we're at. And then with that in place, as I was sort of mentioning earlier, like we kind of have the tools that we need to build uh, a set of interaction tools over it without having to think about the multi-platform part so much. Like you just think about, okay, well, these are the different kinds of controllers we might see. Um, we might see hands, we might see these things, but I don't have to think about it in terms of, you know, a Vive hand or an Oculus hand or a HoloLens hand or all these things. Like it's all kind of sort of consolidated. You know, in the end you have actions that you're kind of applying towards these different buttons and that kind of whole shebang of complexity and input is sort of kind of put in, in a more you know, uh, well-defined terms that is more universal. So that's that's the first step. Beyond that, I think in the midterm, I think what's really interesting is, you know, uh, wearables becoming more, you know, popular. So we don't just have, you know, an Oculus headset that can be a standalone that you have, you have other vendors that build their own standalones. And, you know, there's one in particular I'm really interested in is the links. I'm excited to see that come out. Uh, you know, bringing um, pass-through mixed reality standalone using the XR2 platform with Lee Motion hand tracking, like all these amazing things just coming in a package. Like, I'm really excited to see where that goes. And, you know, as the tech sort of becomes more commodified, uh, you know, it's possible for more vendors to kind of take off the shelf parts and put together a headset. And, you know, ideally with the tech being easier to build for now with OpenXR, you know, more people can kind of come into the space, say, here, you don't need to explicitly support my headset, but your apps should be able to compile very easily if they support Android, uh, that kind of thing. And hopefully we'll see an ecosystem start to evolve from that. Um, and and f further out, like I would really like to see, you know, more in the space of what, you know, Facebook's working on with their control labs uh, wristband. So, so I think that kind of control labs, you know, acquisition was a really good thing for them because it, it allows them to have uh, kind of like less controversial neural input if if i can say that right like um you know we're basically for those who aren't familiar like the control labs bracelet it listens to nerve impulses that come from your brain that kind of signal intent to your motor functions in your fingers to kind of give an, an uh, um uh you know a command out to what your app is kind of trying to do so you can actually do full articulated hand tracking with this you know like you can detect all the intent to move each joint in your finger uh you can even move fingers that you don't have so this is really good for accessibility as well so people are missing fingers or you know that, that kind of thing you can even st your, your nerves still send the signal so you can still capture that and and pick up on you know the intent to move they even showed demos where you can move like a sixth finger and that kind of thing um and why this is important is that yes accessibility but also like you can move things without having to physically move your hand and you can also react to things quicker than having to you know so in imagine instead of having to think about your you putting your hand out and then touching something virtual well there's a lot of latency in terms of you know your camera capturing your finger motion after the fact whereas before you're capturing the signal before it even happens so you can actually get much faster latency and and this this has so many applications for you know like i can see like in medicine and neurosurgery and all kinds of um applications in terms of just like having to react quickly to you know something critical there's just so much there and then just the simplicity of 
um, using an interface. So you can like say you're in your kitchen and you want to interact with something. You just like kind of like do a minor, you know, imagined gesture and you can interact with something. Uh, scroll through a list and touch things without having to touch it. So that kind of stuff is just really in interesting to see where that goes. Is there anything that you think, is there anything you're surprised hasn't come to VR yet that you think should have? Mm, it's hard for me to say like what people should be doing. Um, should may be the wrong word. So I think a part of it, like one thing I really want VR to be good for is productivity. And I think that there's like a whole spectrum of, of you know, possible applications in terms of being able to use it as a work device, you know, uh, augmenting your desk and that kind of thing. And I think, you know, the tech has been a limiting factor on this, you know, uh, like the resolution is only just getting good enough to be able to read text clearly on a monitor. Uh, AR, it's, you got the other issues. So yeah, text is clear, clear but then... Uh, colors are weird and then you know the opacity of text and and content is is no good with um, you know um with with see-through displays you know uh, the waveguides and such so like the tech is is kind of all over the place right now and uh it's very early days in terms of just getting something that makes sense for someone to buy so it's a little bit difficult for me to say like you know we should have this productivity app or we should have you know uh, xyz app but I think as as this device is starting to kind of prove itself, you know, the Quest 2 has done incredibly well, it seems, from the sales numbers. Uh, as they sort of move past this, this generation of hardware, we have, you know, pretty good compute, great optics, you know, we'll get some bigger field of view. Hopefully we'll get some color pass-through cameras in the next generation. You know, all these kinds of things, the pieces are all coming together to kind of open up the doors for uh, incredible apps that, you know, we really couldn't think of with existing hardware. and. I, I will add one thing as well that surprised me that I didn't see coming um, is that VR is actually one of the most incredible technologies right now for fitness in this quarantine. Like um, I, I used to be really into to bouldering and going to the gym and, and you know, with, with a lot of them closing down in my area, like uh, it's a little tricky to, to kind of, you know, you know, go out there in the pandemic to go to a, you know, a gym. Uh, but, you know, working out at home, I started using Supernatural and I, I, using almost every day now. And that's, that surprised me that I'd be willing to sweat in a headset like that. And, and I'm very happy that there's, you know, so many apps coming out there to cater that need of fitness. And that definitely surprised me too. I, I didn't see that happening so soon with the headset still being 500 gram boxes on your face, yeah. but <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. the experience is so good that it doesn't matter. Yeah. I mean, uh, for me to do it, like I, I, use, I have like my old quest one dedicated to it. Um, cause I don't, I don't want to sweat in like a newer headset. And then I have like a, you know, it's like a halo strap with headphones on it. So I could use that dedicated for that. And, and that is able to balance the weight pretty well. But yeah, I think like built in the, yeah, the ergonomics are still quite bad. And so like with fitness, you're moving your head around quick, like it shifts around. And so it's not the best experience, but it, it's still good enough that I'm happy to do it. And a lot of people are happy to do it. And that's surprising too. So. Yeah, it, it's great to see what it's what VR has been able to do in this pandemic in general so far. Absolutely, I really value the the social experience of being in VR. I think there's something incredible about you know being able to yeah, now with your hands too, just be able to like you know talk to someone, uh, you know, just articulate, show things, point at stuff. You know, like one thing that's incredible to me is that you can stand in a circle in a virtual space, and and there's that consistency of saying like I'm looking to my right, and that person is is to my right, like it is you know to everyone else. Whereas in Zoom, like everyone's faces are wherever you know they were shaped, so like there's not that consistency of space, you know, where if you're, you're not next to someone else, you're, you're in your own spot, which I think loses a lot of the social experience, like being able to stand in a circle, having your own breakouts organically form, where you just kind of go talk to someone on the side, that kind of thing is, is just so remarkable about VR's uh, social capabilities. Yeah. Webcam grids will seem anachronistic pretty soon. Yeah, definitely. Anyway, Eric, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for joining us. Likewise. Cheers.